Hey guys, Shelby again with Shelby Patrick Realty. Today we have a special guest and my buddy. Andrew Van Dyke, Modern Woodman of America Financial. Yes, exactly. Yeah, He's going to go ahead and break down what financial literacy may look like for those of you exploring how to be financially free, how to be financially independent, and how to begin building a financial platform and basis that is going to best serve you long term, right? Absolutely. And uh, I've been in real estate for a little while now myself. I've My wife and I have some investment units, and Andrew has some really great insights when it comes to being on this side of the fence, or if you're on the other side of the fence where you're just getting your career rolling, you're starting to make some money and trying to figure out what do I do with my income and how does this best impact my future? So thank you for coming in today. Of course, thanks uh, for having welcome me. Welcome to our downtown setup where we're trying to go ahead and sit down with people that are like-minded, that are have a direction they're going for uh, financial independence, mm -hmm. for investing, learning about what we can do with the, with the tools and the investments that we are getting. So basically today, one of the first things I wanna to talk to you about is just basically the, the financial basics. What are some things that, from your perspective, uh, people starting out and in investing maybe aren't aware of, or what's a great plan or perspective on where do I begin? What do I even look at and why am I doing this? Yeah, um, I think a great thing that I see with a lot of my clients that I try to work with them is they try to take the last part of the income that's left over and invest that number. The thing is, is the way life goes and the way that families go in business, there's not always that five, 10, 15% left over at the end of the month. So my biggest tip, if you're starting out, is instead of your first thought being, how much does maybe my home cost? Sorry, Shelby. <laughs> but it's more like, how can I save 10% of my income and then do everything else from there? Because if you can save 10 to 15% of your income through your working career and start in your early 20s, you will retire very well. And it's kind of like uh, the idea of mitigating chasing your tail, right? Because mm -hmm. by the end of the month, all these things come up and then you're like, oh man, my AC broke or this or that happened. And before you know it, you've got like nothing ready to save, right? Or invest and then you're like holding on to it. So kind of creating that discipline and that mindset of being, uh, of being on top of it. You know, you don't want to be behind on when you're 30, 35 years old. And it's like, okay, if I even show you a five to 10 year opportunity cost, and we'll get to that on the whiteboard in a second, it's a massive investment over 20, 30 years. So if you can start in your early 20s when that income gets rolling, you're gonna be massively better off than when you're starting when you're early 30s, 35 years old. And you have a lot more money to make up in that by wasting cool. that time. So for an amateur investor or a beginner investor, let's go ahead and break it down for them. Instead of going to Starbucks, you know, three, four, five days a week, instead of going out to dinner four or five times a week, let's go ahead and break it down for the minimal side of things. Like what if you put 250 bucks or 500 bucks disposable income per month away, what does that look like? And for that, let's go ahead and visit the whiteboard. All right, so give us the breakdown. Say I've got 250 bucks and 500 bucks a month that I want to start investing. What could that and what may that look like? Sure, so let me practice this with saying investments are never guaranteed. If your financial advisor is gonna sit down with you and tell you that your money's in the market and they're gonna get you this return, they're wrong. They may do that, but they can't promise you that. So I just wanna preface this conversation. I'm doing hypothetical returns that have happened and may continue to happen, but nothing is guaranteed. I will say this though, for 30 years, so if you started when you're 25 years old to 55 years old and you put $500 a month in at an assumed 12% rate of return, this would be a fairly aggressive investor, but when you're in your early 20s, there's really no reason to not be aggressive. It's a it's a long-term outlook. You know, it's, it's tough to see that money dip, but it's really more a paper loss than anything. If you don't pull out, you're really okay. As I like to say, if you don't jump off the roller coaster, you don't die. But if you did that for 30 years, $500 a month at a 12% rate of return, you'd have $1.765 million. So that shows you right there what 30 years of just doing $500 a month can get you to in this, that amount of time. Now, if you said, I said earlier, 10% of your income, if you make about, oh, I don't know, 50K a year, that's about 5,000 a year, which is a little less than this 500 a month, but you can see how reasonable it is to put that amount away to get to where you wanna be when you wanna retire. Ever heard of a mutual fund before? I probably should It's have no, heard. You know what a stock is? Yes. You buy a share in, let's just say Tesla, 
and you own a percentage of that company, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. I would not want to bank your retirement on one company's success. Now, Tesla has done very well over the last 10 years. If you're an investor in Tesla, you're probably happy. But as an advisor, I don't feel comfortable with your entire retirement being stuck into one company. If that company fails, so does your money. So instead with a mutual fund, why don't we put Tesla, Microsoft, Apple, Google, and all these big conglomerates, and we have a team of people working to make sure that these stocks are the right ones that we want in this fund at the right percentages. So we're still taking advantage of their consistent market growth, but those two, three, four, five here and there that have those dips, they're so minuscule that you don't feel them as much. So what I would do is I would take this $500 a month, I would stick it into one of these mutual funds, and then depending on what your tax status was, what your income level was, we might look at doing an IRA for you and then funneling that money into the mutual fund under the umbrella of the IRA. So the IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. It is basically your personal 401k. Now, no one's putting into it for you, it's just your money, but that it's a tax deferred account, it grows tax deferred, and it's meant to be there for your retirement. So I put that 500 a month into the mutual fund and then if it's a traditional IRA, it's a tax deduction, or if it's a Roth, it's post-tax, but you get everything tax-free at the end. So there's a couple different ways we could do it. Small business owners, SEP, simple IRAs, you could deduct even more. There's a lot of different umbrellas to put it under, but as far as where the investment would go, generally I like to put my clients in mutual now, funds. Now, if a, if a client has different risk assessments or comfort levels, I'm assuming, are there different types of mutual funds based on their comfort level that you can absolutely so a mutual fund is going to be broken up a little bit like a pie so you might say 60 percent are u.s equities and 20 percent is foreign markets and then the other 20 is bond market bond markets are pretty conservative so if you're a conservative investor you might see 20 to 45 percent of your fund be made up of bonds because they're much more consistent they pay out the dividends the idea of a bond is you give a company at X sum of money, and they're saying, we're gonna pay you an interest for you letting us use your money, and then at the end, we'll give you your money back. I would say, as a, an investor that's still accumulating their investment, you're not that concerned about dividends because it's taking away from the opportunity cost of putting that money back gotcha. in the investment. That makes sense. Dividends, maybe somebody further down their investment pathway may consider it, whereas if you're a newer investor, you probably wanna reallocate those back into your mutual fund. Absolutely, you see most retirement, um, clients or retirees are using some sort of dividend to supplant their income with their investments. Cool. Perfect. Touch on so, historically speaking, what are typical return rates? Because everybody's like, well, "What's my money return going to be like?" So, what are so some something I want to really get into, and I, one of my biggest points is like why aggressive mutual fund investing is better than index investing. Um, so, I think that would be the next point we hit because. And what's in that investing? So back to the whiteboard. Back to the whiteboard. <laughs> so it's a bucket. It's it's the fund. So mutual fund, all the stocks. Got da dun da dun da dun. Your sales charge on average on a long term investment is going to be about 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 every year. That means out of your account, 0.5 to 0.8 percent of it gets taken every year. What pays for that is so people like me can help you manage your account and then the nerds that sit in a dark room and decide which stocks should go in and out do that all day, every day. So if you think back a few months ago when GameStop was huge, at one point some of the growth funds I work with had like 1%, 2% GameStop because short term they were trying to take advantage of that super quick climb. Index funds are much cheaper, 0.01 to 0.04% sales charges. So I hear a lot of people say that index funds are better because you're paying less. Well, the thing is, is they stick those same type of companies in Tesla, Apple, Home Depot, Microsoft, yada, 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 but they don't have a team of people managing them. So they leave those stocks in there for long periods of time. So the indexes have historically done eight to 10%, whereas some of the more aggressive mutual funds I've worked with have done closer to 12 to 14%. So I'm always down to pay Let's see here, if we did, let's just cut the difference and we'll say the lowest sales charge possible. You did 9% with a 0.01 sales charge, you got 8.99% return. Well, if you went over to a mutual fund, we'll split the difference on here and say you did 0.6, you owed them, that's the one that I use, uh, Growth Fund of America is a 0.6 for. Well, you take, let's say 13% minus 0.64 and we're still at 12.36%. So where did you get better off? Yeah. Much better in the mutual fund. 
And to answer your question, if you're a more conservative investor, or you're getting close to retirement, then index may be a little more sense for you because yeah. you don't care about hitting that 12 is 14%. You're not as volatile anymore. But for that younger investor that's really trying to grow, pay the company a little bit extra to manage your money so you can get those types of returns versus these. And I can show you the Growth Fund of America tracks against the S&P 500 index. If any of you invest, you probably know what an S&P 500 is. I can tell you that from 2000, if you put 10K in, there has not been one point where this growth fund has lost to the index, even in 08. So it went down, don't get me wrong, but because they're actively managing it, they can stay ahead of the index. Still winners in downturns. Exactly. Dang. Fire. Awesome, thanks for dropping like a bomb of knowledge. Yeah, that's a pretty big one for me. Yeah, that's awesome. You definitely know your stuff, so appreciate you for coming on, kind of walking people through this. Um, on the other side, right? So that's kind of the basics. And of course, there's a million different ways we can go with basic principles for investing, but that's kind of like the meat of it, right? For mm -hmm. people trying to get into it. Uh, let's talk a little bit on the other side of the fence for people that may be getting through their career, that have some investments. Maybe let's take an example of like an agent, like a lot of agents that we work with and that I interact with have maybe a, a rental property or multiple rental properties. Uh, they make good income, of course, with the market, how it's been, it's been incredible for people's pocketbook. And uh, more agents that I talk to than probably don't, probably have lump sums of, these, of their income sitting in bank accounts and checking accounts versus deploying it in maybe some more, uh, maybe fairly stable return environments or more aggressive or whatever they end up doing because they just don't simply know what to do with the funds. And they also wanna have funds for, you know, quote unquote, a rainy day. So. Let's go ahead and just kind of chat through uh, a scenario and yeah. just maybe get your, your insights and opinions. So say you're an agent and look, we'll keep it simple. So you have one rental property, okay. right? And the rental property is mortgage is a thousand bucks a month. Okay. And uh, you've got a tenant in there, you're cash flow positive, right? That okay. doesn't really necessarily matter. It's just a good thing to have. And then you've got your primary occupancy and maybe your mortgage on that's 2000 a month, okay? Um, if you're a real estate agent, you've had maybe a good year and you've set aside, you know, 100K in uh, income that's uh, post-tax and you're saying to yourself, cool, I just want to have that for rainy day fund. You know, people say that cash is king. So if I'm sitting in, you know, my traditional bank account, um, you're not collecting you know, much savings, right? I think no. we did the example, like 100K, you might make what? 100, 100 bucks, bucks. Yeah. yeah. Especially where the banks are heading right now. I mean, Wells Fargo got rid of that line of credit. They're drawing back. So what what was already a minuscule amount you got is now even lower down to 0 0.01, 0 0.04. So yeah, if you had 100K and you're talking about making 100 to Jeez. 250 bucks for a year. And what's, uh, what's the principle of interest, historically speaking? Or not interest, sorry, inflation. inflation. Yeah. So on average, you want to account for about 2.9. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm an inflation expert, but I think we'd all be lying if we said we weren't going to see things increase a little bit over the next year or two. But um, as a historical average, it's been about 2.5 to 2.9. Good benchmark. Exactly. So you're basically losing money on your 100K sitting in the bank or oh, 10 yeah. grand or whatever it may be. I right? would just bank on losing 2% every year. Yeah. Okay. So in another situation, given that you want to have access, say if the market crashes for some mm -hmm. unknown reason, maybe it does, and we go through a transition, people want to be best prepared to have cash on hand to cover expenses, they don't want to lose their rental, they don't want to lose their primary residence. So maybe this is a whiteboard conversation again. Yeah, Can we're you, straight back to give the you some arthritis. Yeah, I, need, I need some. Let's break this down. Perfect. So walk us through this, with this example at least. So what I heard from you was basically that they have a commitment of 3K a month, between their $2,000 personal mortgage and the 1K a month mortgage that their rental property um, tenant currently covers right now. Now, for the sake of planning, I'm, I'm planning as if that tenant is not there. So if something were to happen, it's like you're saying, if the market's down you know, 10%, then it's kind of be, gonna be crappy if we have to pull from the mutual fund at that point to pay off these mortgages or to pay off the monthly payment on that. So my general rule of thumb is, is you wanna keep a year of your mortgage payments in the bank, whether that's your personal or investment properties. The reason people got, well, plenty of reasons, but one of the reasons people got screwed in 08 was because they had their home and four or five rental properties that were, let's just say 2K a month uh, mortgages. And sure, they had tenants for the first six months. And then after that, they had no tenants. So they had an $8,000 monthly gap to make up. No one planned for that. That's why everyone got screwed. So if you kept a year worth of mortgage in there, which would be 30 times 12, so $36,000, 
I think that's a really perfect number to keep inside of your liquid savings. That is the account that's literally right below your checking. You can move it right to your checking and it's all completely liquid. I would take the difference on that, which is $64,000, and I would stick that into an accessible mutual fund. So the thing to know about mutual funds is they say they're liquid, and they are. You can pull the money whenever you have it, have it within a few days. One thing to know though is if you put money in on in C shares, you really do not want to pull it out within that first year. Because if you do that, you're going to take short-term capital gains on that growth that you've had. Whereas if you just waited the year, you don't have to pay the short-term capital gains. And that's kind of the tax. benefit of setting aside one year's rainy day insurance. Right? Exactly. Is that if the market was down, you ha still have a year of mortgage payments set aside that you yeah. don't have to go to the investment. You give the investment time to come back up. So for instance, we had aggressive clients take 15% hits during COVID. Well, it took the most aggressive accounts only 60 days to recover after that wow. 15%. 08, it was about mid 2010 before the last of the aggressive accounts recovered. And that was the most gnarly thing we've seen. COVID is about the second most gnarly thing we've seen since the 08 crash. It took 60 days for your investment to, to return to what it originally was at the start of COVID. Cool. So that's why we keep this 36,000 there to hedge that risk. Okay. So worst case scenario could take a couple years potentially, and if you're giving, if you're setting yourself up for a rainy day fund for a year or a little bit longer out every year, and once you're out of that first year, you don't pay short term capital gains tax. So Perfect. it's it's just the same as it being in savings at that point. And do you as far know as your what are those cost. those capital gains tax percentage rates? So well, let's just say you know what we could go aggressive, but just for simple math, let's just say it was ten percent. Instead of your money sitting in a bank account where you made about $64, which would be the 0 .001, um, you made about $6,400 because that's 10% of the account. So just do the difference on that for one year. $64,000 in the bank over 10 years is going to make you, on very simple math, about $640. Add another 10 years in, so after 20, and you're at about 1280. Now, compound interest plays a little bit of a factor, but you didn't crack 2,000 of gains, basically, now, over 20 years. Now, what's 64K look like with you? Well, if you did 64K for 10 years and didn't put anything else in at an assumed rate of 10%, which is still, while being an aggressive investor, a somewhat conservative hypothetical, 173,000 after 10 years. And if you let that grow for 20, 468K. This is just an initial investment of $64,000. That's 20 years, 10 years. That's 10 years, 20 years. So that's your opportunity and cost right there. This number and this number is assuming you don't add another dollar to that number. Yep, that was $0 Jeez. a month, 10% over 20 years. All right, so as we wrap this up, thanks for yeah. your time and your wealth of knowledge today. I'm sure there's a lot of people that'll be shooting us a message or commenting to Probably. help them out to get onto a path of investing. Um, tell us a little bit about the company you work for, their situation, and why you like uh, being a part of their, their corporation. Yeah, um, so I work for Modern Woodmen of America, and chances are you've never heard of us. And the reason you haven't heard of us is because we don't spend your dollars on Super Bowl commercials, um, our shareholders' <laughs> pockets, the CEOs, our money suit pocket. That's not where your money's going. It's going directly back in the communities you live in. I've been able to donate thousands of dollars since my time working for this company. Um, we don't charge advisor fees. We've been around since 1883, where we've been through two world worlds, multiple pandemics. Um, it's a company that is very foundationally strong. It cares about its members and its employees, and it's willing to make sure that both of them are taken care of, even if it's less profit for them at the end of the day. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Tried and true integrity and character, huh? Honest integrity effort every day will always lead to success. I like it. Put that on your wall. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for your time, Andrew. Thank you, Shelby. Always good. Thanks for watching, you guys. If you have a chance, go ahead and click that like button. Helps us a ton. Subscribe to our channel because we're going to be releasing content on a regular basis to help answer questions you guys have. If you have any questions, definitely leave a comment below so that we know what to answer as we produce content on a regular basis. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll talk to you soon.